Recently, this tricky math problem got a lot of traction. Is there actually $10 missing? Apparently, this was the first question in some set of questions focused on problem solving. Let's take a quick read through it and see if there is $10 missing, or maybe the $10 or the math books we sniffed along the way, or maybe something else. It says, three girls paid $100 each, a total of $300, to share a motel room. Later, the desk clerk, realizing she should have only charged $250, gives the room attendant $50 and asks him to return it to the three girls. Unable to divide the money three ways, he decides to give $10 to each girl and pockets the remaining $20. The girls have now paid $90 each, or $270 total, for the room, and the room attendant has $20. What happened to the other $10? So they paid 300, but then at the end of the day, we've got 270 plus 20, that's 290. So what happened to the other 10? It can definitely seem a bit tricky at a glance. Something does seem amiss, but this is just another take on a classic riddle, the so-called missing dollar riddle. It's deliberately written to tempt you into farcical reasoning. So let's look closer at the details so we can spot the shrouded hogwash. The key to the trick here is presenting information that contradicts a hidden premise, a hidden premise which the puzzle writer hopes you'll accept implicitly. The girls have now paid $90 each, or $270 for the room, and the room attendant has $20. This is true, but the hidden premise the writer wants you to accept is that this $270 and $20 together should account for that total of $300. Hence, you feel there's $10 missing. But this is absurd on its face, because these $2 counts, $270 and $20, are dollar counts from the same pool, being the pool of dollars that the girls have lost, so of course it doesn't add to 300. Remember, $30 were returned to the girls, we just went over that. So obviously you can't get the $300 total by only accounting for money that they lost because they didn't lose all $300. In fact, all they lost was $270. $250 are with the desk clerk, that's for the motel room, and $20 are with that scumbag attendant. They then got $30 returned to them, and of course, in total, this accounts for all $300. The $270 that they lost, and the $30 that they kept. Asking what happened to the other $10 trips a lot of people up because you expect, if you think about it, you'll find that $10 somewhere in your own accounting of the situation. But you won't because the addition of 270 and 20 is a hog wash move. The 270 that the girls paid includes the $20 the attendant kept, so to add them is clearly an error. You know what else is an error is sleeping on the new Trick or Treat collection exclusively at mathshin.com. This is a super comfy oversized sweater perfect for fall featuring the new Halloween design with three children dressed up as legendary mathematicians, Erdish, Euler, and Emmy Nother trick or treating at your door. It's available only through the end of this year. So go to mathshin.com, link in the description and pinned comment and pick up some merch. And now that you understand this error, that's one less situation where you might find famous slasher movie villain, Error Eric, coming to wiggle his hips at you. Let us all sleep with the security of our righteousness. Like I said, this riddle is a bit of a classic and there's a great chance you've seen it before or one of its variations. The Universal Book of Mathematics by David Darling says in the missing dollar problem entry that a version of this puzzle appeared in R.M. Abraham's Diversions and Pastimes released in 1933, full title Diversions and Pastimes, a second series of Winter Nights Entertainment. Another source I see cited as having a missing dollar puzzle is the book Mathematical Fallacies by a fella named Cecil B. Reed, published also in 1933 but I can find absolutely nothing about this man or this book, nothing whatsoever to suggest either one of them ever existed.
it, except for a few citations mentioning his name on PuzzleMuseum.com. So if anyone knows more about this C.B. Reed or his book, please share with the class. The Wikipedia page for this riddle goes into a surprising amount of depth and even has this schematic to explain what's going on in the riddle. I can't say this ranks highly among the helpful schematics I've encountered in my life, but yeah. There you go. Perhaps a more helpful thing the Wikipedia page mentions is if you're really struggling to see the absurdity of the original riddle, you might understand it better by reframing the same type of problem, but with a larger discount. Say for example, just as before, the three girls paid $100 each, a total of $300, and later the desk clerk realizes she should have only charged $100, and so gives the room attendant $200 back to return to the girls. Again, the room attendant is unable to divide the money three ways, so he decides to give $66 to each girl and pockets the remaining two. The girls have now paid $34 each, or 102 total, for the room, and the room attendant has $2. What happened to the other $196? Now it's very obvious an error has been made because the missing number is so large. I think it makes it a lot easier to see that this count has completely neglected the $66 given back to each of the three girls. That accounts for such a huge discrepancy. And again, adding 102 and 2 double counts the 2 because the $102 spent includes the $2 that that wily attendant pocketed. The Wikipedia page for the riddle also contains those two other variations I mentioned. I couldn't find either of the books I mentioned, the Cecil B. Reed book or the Diversions and Pastimes book electronically. I was able to find this one physically and have since ordered it, so perhaps we will encounter it again in the future. But Wikipedia does contain what it claims are those aforementioned variations. So let's finish by looking at those two earlier versions of this sort of puzzle. Frankly, I don't think either one of these variations feels very similar to the classic missing dollar puzzle. Let's read the first one here from Abraham's Diversions and Pastimes. A traveler returning to New York found that he had only a $10 postal money order and that his train fare was $7. The ticket clerk refused to accept the money order so the traveler went across the road to a pawn shop and pawned it for $7. On his way back to the station, he met a friend who, to save the traveler the trouble of returning to redeem the money order, bought the pawn ticket from him for $7. The traveler then bought his ticket and still had $7 when he got to New York. Who made the loss? Now, I'm not 100% sure I understand this phrasing, who made the loss. Does that just mean who made out in the negative in this situation? Who lost money? I feel like it's pretty obvious. I'm no pawn store expert, but I mean, let's just run the basic numbers here. Let's start with the traveler who had that money order and then pawned it. So the traveler had that $10 money order, but he pawned it and he's not gonna get it back because he gave his friend the pawn ticket that would allow him to get it back instead. So we'll just chalk that up to minus 10. He loses that $10 money order. However, when he pawned it, he got that loan of $7 for his pawned item. And when he gave the pawn ticket to his friend, he got $7 for that as well. Of course, his train fare was $7, so that's gonna cancel out one of those sevens. But in the end, this comes up to just negative 10 plus seven or negative three. So the traveler has lost $3, but not really because he was intending to buy a train ticket that costs $7. So in that way, he made out with plus four. He spent four fewer dollars than he had anticipated. So I'm gonna go ahead and call that a plus four. That's a gain for the traveler. As for the friend in the pawn shop, we can't really say because we don't know the terms of the loan, but the pawn shop's not in the business of giving away money. So with fees and interest, they're going to profit off of this situation. If the friend never redeems his pawn ticket and gets that $10 money order, well then the pawn shop gave away seven bucks but now has a $10 money order. If the friend does go and close out the loan, he's gonna have to pay fees and interest that all make it worth the pawn shop's time. I'm no pawning expert, but it seems like the friend has just put himself in a completely stupid situation. He paid $7 for a pawn ticket, 
which is more like a liability. He's gonna take the pawn ticket to the pawn shop who needs to be repaid the $7 that they loaned out. Okay, so minus $7 to pay back the loan. They don't just loan $7 out of the generosity of their hearts. There's also fees and interest that needs to be paid. So we'll have to clock that up too. So fees and interest. And then after all that, this dumb friend is gonna get a money order that can be redeemed for $10. If the friend goes and gets that pond item immediately, then maybe they'll forgive any fees and not charge any interest. And so he'll make out with a wonderful minus four. But yeah, unless I just completely don't understand money orders or pawn shops, that seems like a completely obvious problem. The friend has lost money. Then the version from the alleged writer Cecil B. Reed's book, Mathematical Fallacies, goes like this. A man puts $50 in the bank. Then on subsequent days, he withdraws 20, leaving 30, then 15, leaving 15, then nine, leaving six, and finally six leaving zero. But $30 plus 15 plus six is $51. So where did the extra dollar come from? This definitely has more of a similar flavor to the classic missing dollar riddle. However, this again, I think is a pretty obvious puzzle. There are two different types of money we might say here. There are withdrawn amounts and there are amounts that are left over after a withdrawal. And here in the sum, 30 plus 15 plus six, they've added up amounts of money that were left. And that doesn't have any necessary relation to the original amount of money. It's a little sneaky because 15 and six were also amounts of money that were withdrawn, but that $30 right at the start, that amount was never withdrawn. It was only left. If you only add up the withdrawals, $20 plus $15 plus $9, plus six dollars, you indeed get that total of 50 like you would expect. But when you're just adding amounts that were left over, $30 left over, 15 left over, six left over, that's not necessarily gonna add up to the original amount. For example, imagine the man had withdrawn $1 at a time. Then at first there'd be $49 left over, then $48 left over, then $47 left over, and so on, all the way down to there finally being $1 left over, and then of course $0 left over. Obviously, adding these amounts doesn't give you the original total of 50. In fact, this is 1,225. It has nothing to do with 50. So there you go. Don't let Error Eric catch you adding up amounts in a bank that were left over after withdrawals in order to calculate the total amount in the bank initially. Let his soul be forsaken and your virtue cast him into the depths. So those are some timeless, erroneous accounting riddles. And with tax season right around the corner, there's really nothing spookier than erroneous accounting. Oh boy, don't even get me started. I'm on a payment plan for an extra large pepperoni pizza. I'm unstable, I'm feeling hard to keep the cable cut and untuck the table If Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal I Wish to sell my own fake cause I'm jaded Hate the odds that I calculated Press and pull and pray and push it all the way through the whole blue planet They 